Hi, my name is Alex Fletcher, and I'm the Associate Director of Development for the Public Knowledge Project. I'm going to give a presentation on multimodal journal publishing. This was first given at the first international symposium on multimodal publishing, uh, hosted by the University of Victoria. I work for the Public Knowledge Project, which is based at Simon Fraser University, which is on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Quiquitlam, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I'm a member of the Métis Nation of British Columbia, via my father's mother. I was raised with an awareness, but not, without, not with a real connection to that culture. And I'm working to understand my settler roots and history, both from my European and Métis heritage. So um, I'd like to start with what multimodal publishing looks like in OGS. And uh, credit for these examples goes to Kate Shuttleworth, who's a digital publishing librarian, and she works with numerous journals uh, based out of Simon Fraser University, which is where these examples come from. While I'm going through these, I'd like you to assess a few things. Where does the content live? Does it live on your computer, your server, or somebody else's? If it lives on somebody else's server, then why, for how long, and what happens then? Does it play well with others? Does the content have a standard format? Can it be archived? Does the metadata conform to a standard? Are the semantics there for machine readable formats? Um, is it accessible? And finally, if any of these is not a positive answer, if for example, you're hosting content on somebody else's computer and you think it may go down in the future, what does that mean? Can the downsides be mitigated? Can you encapsulate the content so it lives on your system? Can you convert to a more standard format? Or if not, can you at least scrape the content later and then uh, solve that problem down the road? So the examples I'm going to present here are from a publishing course. This is Pub 371 called The Structure of the Book Publishing Industry in Canada. And this is a course taught uh, by Hannah McGregor at Simon Fraser University. So here's an example of a timeline. This is um, using a, an open source tool called timeline.js, which is by nightlab.com. It is a free and open source tool, but in this case, it's delivered via a content delivery network, which means that the code that supports the, the, the timeline is on a separate server and that may go down at some point and disappear. Here's an example of a YouTube video and this is embedded within an article. Um, in this case, uh, YouTube is a, a corporate entity and their business model may not be compatible with yours. They may be ad-based, they may have copyright strikes, uh, that content may not live there forever. And here's an example of a interactive storyboard using a tool called stellar.co. And in this case, my understanding of Stellar is that they are a private company and it's not easy to get content out of that service should that service's business model change or should that content be threatened. Here's an example of a podcast and this is a standard audio file uploaded into OJS. This is a good example of a case where the content can be encapsulated within OJS and protected from the ravages of time in a way that might destroy other kinds of content. So a little bit about OJS for those who may not be familiar with it. It is both a workflow and publishing tool for publishing academic journals. And relevant to this presentation is it doesn't really care what kind of files you upload, upload into it. As an author, you submit something editable, then you go through the peer review process and the copy editing process using, again, something editable. And then some kind of magic occurs outside of OGS to transform that from something editable into something presentable. And then OGS presents that, that, that piece of content as what the end user reads. So in most cases, something editable is typically a Word document or an open document. It's a word processor file, but OGS doesn't care what it is. It could be anything. Typically, something presentable means a PDF file. That's the way that most OGS users present their content. But again, OGS really doesn't care. You can upload anything you want. And the magic, uh, the point at which you convert something editable into something presentable, that's typically just saving as PDF from within Microsoft Word or uh, LibreOffice or equivalent. There's often very little magic actually there. So a word about experimentation, because a lot of multimodal publishing is somewhat experimental. Um, we seek experiments as partnerships. Uh, we, as an open source group with a very large user community, we try to meet 90% of the needs of 90% of the journals. And that means publishing in a lot of different languages, publishing in all sorts of different fields of study, and all sorts of different publishing cultures. It's impossible for us to accommodate that entire community and meet all of their needs 100% of the time. So we hope that the individual users who need that last 10% can pursue it in the spirit of open source, can communicate with us if there's a successful experiment or if changes are needed, and then can share those results with others in the spirit of open source to improve the software. So I do have some recommendations for pursuing uh, multimodal publishing, and then I'll show a demonstration that, uh, that demonstrates this. 
The first is to encapsulate your content. And what this means is that if you're publishing in HTML, which is the form you'll be doing most commonly with multimodal publishing, it's very easy if you're not careful to create an HTML document that has bits and pieces out in different places of the internet. And that may make for uh, easy maintenance in the short term, but longer term, you're depending on a very brittle set of connections. And while you can preserve that HTML, if it depends on JavaScript or fonts or images or videos elsewhere on the internet, and those pieces go down, then you're not able to preserve that content and it will eventually age poorly and disappear. Embrace genre. Um, it's tempting to think of multimodal publishing as um, genreless, um, do anything you want, be creative and have no constraints. But actually the demonstration I gave earlier, the, the forms of content that I showed earlier fall within some very clear genres. There's timelines, there's videos, there's audio files. And when you embrace genre and decide what as a journal you're going to present, you can set down a pipeline for each of those types of pieces of content. So you're not creating a brand new um, website, essentially, every time you publish a new article. Uh, you need to understand your technical debt and keep it simple as much as possible. Uh, some of the examples that were given during the conference were cases where, for example, uh, content was produced in um, Flash. And if you've got experience with Flash, you'll know it's now been decommissioned and no longer functions. In some cases, it was necessary for those files to be converted to other formats. And in especially interactive cases, it was necessary to essentially take a video recording of walking through various paths in that piece of content. Now, if you were considering doing that kind of approach from the start to produce content in a, a standard to compliant form, obviously you would never do that. And so that's a case where eventual technical debt was very expensive by choosing some format decisions at the outset in a way that did not favor longevity and in particular open formats. Be aware of accountability. Um, one of the big issues with multimodal publishing is accessibility. It is possible to produce multimodal content that is accessible, but you need to be very careful to choose your tools uh, in a way that supports that at the outset. If you are thinking that you can publish content now and resolve accessibility later, it's not likely to happen. And uh, you don't want to find out when you're challenged legally about your obligations for accessibility when you could take it into account at the very beginning. Furthermore, uh, there are issues around global access when you go to multimodal content. Consider that you're going to be likely using uh, larger bandwidth. You may have content delivery coming from various parts of the world. Uh, it may be more technically challenging to produce and to, to read for end users. Uh, it may be more difficult to localize into different languages, et cetera. Um, so uh, if you are producing cutting edge content, consider how that looks to folks who may not be able to view that content as easily as you. A lot of this is planning and policy. It's not technical decision-making. Ideally, if you make the right technical decisions, you won't find yourself becoming out of necessity a software startup. Make clear decisions at the outset, choose your tools carefully, and then follow patterns to make it easier on yourself. Many of the examples that I've seen for multimodal publishing are very ambitious and they start with, uh, with a good quality of output, but they can't continue the pace of production because the cost of producing the content is too high. So make simple choices and avoid becoming a software startup. I have a quick demonstration here of a way that I would recommend producing multimodal content that follows the path that I've just been describing. And I will just show the motivation for this. So this is a tool that I mentioned before for producing timelines. And it's called timeline.js and it's produced by a group called Night Lab. This is an open source tool. And so right from the outset, we know that we're able to encapsulate the content because the license will allow us to do that for the software. And um, we will proceed with that. So uh, the way this works is essentially you've got a series of dates, you've got text and a title, and you've got images and multimedia content. And you can navigate through the timeline interactively to see, in this case, how Whitney Houston's career developed. This is an example that's used uh, by Night Lab to show the capabilities of this tool. Um, and if you look at their instructions for how to use this tool, uh, the first step here is to create a Google spreadsheet. And I would suggest that that is not the path you should take for reasons I've already laid out. If you use a Google spreadsheet, then that content is easy to enter and it's easy to create, but it will live on Google spreadsheet until that spreadsheet moves or the API changes or Google's decision to maintain this kind of content changes, et cetera. There's many ways this could break. 
So what I've done is I've taken a look at what the example has. The example has just a quick piece of HTML, which is the wrapper around all the content. And then there's timeline data here. And you can see here that there are a series of different events and titles. There's text, there's multimedia, et cetera. And this is the content in a format called JSON that populates the JavaScript um, timeline for presentation to the user. Now, I've just started, I realize, using a bunch of different acronyms. Uh, I will say that OGS doesn't hold your hand through this. Uh, it's a very flexible tool, but it does require a basic amount of knowledge of how these tools work in order to embed them in the content in a way that's well preserved. Um, it's not rocket science, but it does require essentially a few basic web developer tools. Um, and I would argue that if you are going to need to understand uh, or some of the, the issues around multimodal publishing, like longevity of formats, like accessibility, you're going to have to understand these things. And so there's really no way around that uh, skill set. If you have a tool that's promising to solve all these problems for you without requiring you to have these skills, you're not going to know much about how it's working. And you're likely going to be embedding your content in forms that's difficult to convert later, that's maybe uh, behind a private tool, uh, maybe that's not got a permissive license, maybe that's not going to last very long. So I do apologize for the acronyms and the code here but I promise I won't spend much time on it. And it actually isn't that demanding if you do have some of those skills. So I've taken this example, which is the uh, Whitney Houston timeline, and I've moved that into OJS. And the way I've done that is I've taken uh, the set of files that's required. There is the main HTML file, and then there's a series of dependent files. If you published with HTML in OJS, you'll be familiar with this. This is the place where you put your multimedia, your, uh, your images and so on. So in this case, we've done just that. We've got a couple of images that come up from the timeline, but we also have the timeline JavaScript, the fonts and the CSS files that represent the library that we're using to, to um, present this content. Uh, I also threw an MP3 file in here just for fun. And there's also a, a video file, which I'll, I'll just show the motivation for this right now. Um, if I look back at the example here, we have um, a couple of images with some text, but the very third item on this list here is a YouTube video. And in fact, that video has gone down. So this is a good demonstration of the kinds of problems I'm trying to solve here. So that video is down, I can't use it. So instead of that, I've just added to the uh, article, a video file of my cat. So when those are uploaded, um, there are some adjustments required and I'll show a quick example of that later. But you essentially have within OJS um, an article that includes the same multimedia, but now this is living within OJS and hosted within OJS. And we have this timeline presentation. The important thing to notice here is that this looks no different to the end user, but in this case, all of the code and all of the style sheets and all of the images and videos are hosted within OJS. So if you are able to preserve content in your OJS, you're backing up the content, um, it is guaranteed to remain there as long as you're following your own best practices, you're not dependent on YouTube, you're not dependent on Flickr, you're not dependent on the Night Lab website that's providing the JavaScript tool. It all lives within that single article within OJS. In fact, there's several ways you could do this. One way, the way that I've demonstrated is to have the content wrapped all into the single article. And if you tend to produce content that maybe is a little bit different every time and that you never need to, you never want to go back and maintain, this is the way to do it. But if you were producing content uh, consistently using a timeline tool. You didn't mind a bit of um, maintenance on older articles if you had to say upgrade the library at a later date. You could maintain a single copy of that timeline tool and, uh, and use that from all articles. All right, let's take a quick look at the HTML that was, that was produced to do this. Um, it's essentially a quick wrapper around a few important things. The most important here is the data that, that uh, populates the timeline. And you'll see here there's um, metadata about the timeline and then a series of events. And this is the same as you would do for that timeline JavaScript, uh, regardless of whether you're doing it in OJS or anywhere else. What you've got is URLs to the images, and this is called family.jpg. This is one of the pictures of the family. There is um, a second image here, which I'm not seeing right now. Uh, oh yes, there's the first image right here, Whitney and Hamburg. Second one is the family. And then I've also included a cat video here, which replaces the broken YouTube video link. And that looks like this. So you can see the video works as well. 
from within the OGS installation. So all we've done is we've changed these from Flickr URLs and YouTube URLs to local files. We've uploaded this content into OGS as well. Now, this is a little bit picky, the way that you add this. Um, what OGS does when it presents the HTML file is it looks for file names that it recognizes that you've uploaded as dependent content and then rewrites those into a form that OGS can understand. Um, so it's a little bit finicky how you populate uh, these, these URLs. Um, I'll mention that a little bit later and there's documentation as well. Um, and that's it for the HTML file. It's mostly just a bit of a wrapper. Uh, there's references to the timeline CSS, uh, another CSS file. Uh, the JavaScript is linked from here. And all of these files are served from within OJS. And as I say, the end result doesn't look any different than it would to a user who was hosting this using Flickr and YouTube, but it's much more preservable in this case. Um, I want to talk a bit about how OGS does its work. And um, this is what I referred to earlier about multimodal presentation being a little bit experimental. Um, you have to kind of integrate different pieces of content into OGS. And as a result, it's an area of the software that's not been that well refined. Just in the course of doing this demonstration, I found a few things that were not showstoppers, but that helped me to improve the experience. And uh, one of those is, for example, that OGS wanted to make a text index of the JavaScript code which was slow and obviously you don't want that. You don't want to be searching for a piece of uh, code in the OGS search box. A few other examples here around fonts and around uh, video files from within the, the timeline tool. Um, these are things that I would not have encountered unless I did this experiment myself. And it's likely that if you're out there doing multimodal work, you may run into one of these as well. So this is a chance for you to embrace the open source spirit of OGS. Let us know that you've run into something. If you're capable of suggesting a fix for it, then, then do so as well. And then you'll be able to improve the software um, for the entire publishing community uh, globally that uses OJS. And so we depend on your feedback for that sort of thing. These improvements will go into our next release. And finally, uh, just in terms of how you would do that, this is our support forum. And it's, it's available for anyone to post if they have questions, if they have suggestions, if they're encountering issues. And the PKP team is frequently on this, uh, answering those questions, but also so is the whole publishing community. So if you're doing an experiment with uh, multimodal publishing, if you're not sure whether a certain tool is suitable for multimodal publishing, that'll be preservable long-term, for example, you can ask that question here by posting a new topic. That is the demonstration. Uh, one thing that I'd like to improve is right now it's necessary to manually upload all this content one at a time. And I do apologize for that. That's one thing we've slated for improvement. And um, if you follow these practices, one of the side effects here is that you'll be uh, in conformity with what the requirements are for the tool set for the rest of the scholarly publishing ecosystem. For example, if you're doing uh, using Crossref for DOIs, if you are using OAI PMH for harvesting into some other tool, um, there's a thousand different standards that you need to be uh, careful to observe. And if you follow these practices, those will be observed as well. And you won't be, for example, stepping outside of the OGS website to present content, but then breaking integration with another important tool like uh, OIPMH or Google Scholar or something else. Um, so again, in the example, content was all bundled. There was very little handholding, but there is some necessity for you to understand the technology if you're going to be accessible, if you're going to be future-proof, all that sort of thing. So why don't we see more multimodal publishing? Um, I think the most important cause here is that making the content can be hard. Um, it's really easy to produce a Word document or a, an open document to generate a PDF and then to upload that to the website and publish it in OJS. Um, adding multimedia elements requires more expertise. And even if you have the expertise, it can be very time consuming. So I think that's one of the most important reasons we don't see more multimodal content. Another one is that um, historically tenure and promotion and impact factor have not favored experimental journals. And experimental journals are the ones who have been uh, playing with multimodal content the longest. Um, one of the suggestions that came up during the conference is whether we should embrace the ephemerality of um, multimodal publishing, given that a lot of the examples didn't tend to mature very well. For example, web pages broke, Flash became obsolete, etc. Um, I'm of the view that treating scholarship as a kind of a performance that might be a one-time thing or might be unavailable after a while is not a great outcome. And I'm of the view that it's not necessary to do that. You can make content that will be archivable, that will be accessible, that will be long-term available, that will stand the test of time. And uh, you won't have to choose between uh, newer technologies and 
uh, sacrificing longevity in the process. I do think there's a huge potential for multimodal publishing. I've seen some very effective interactive data sets. It uh, may cater to different learning styles and it can be more accessible. If you have a textual article that's got perhaps a video equivalent or an audio equivalent of narration uh, that caters to, uh, for example, visual disabilities or perhaps also different uh, learning styles. The tools are here to be used now. Um, nothing here is especially um, brand new or cutting edge. All I would say is use them carefully. Thanks for watching. Um, this is my Twitter handle, asymmetry underscore PKP. But uh, if you do have questions or your own experiments or you've got feedback, then the best place to reach us is on the PKP support forum. That is at forum.pkp.sfu.ca. And I will see you there. Thanks for watching.